bad. My bad. It's Chloe. These mic stands are classy. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, one thing you're actually good at, though, that our guests are always really bad at is just making sure you're talking to the microphone. Oh, yeah. Our guests are always so afraid to get close to the mic. Like, <laughs> well, I don't know. I, just I mean, I understand I, why. I, I was always told just pretend like you're making sweet love to it. It's and probably be, like, a really natural. Um, I've heard it so much. You know. I'm not, it's probably not natural to have a conical thing so close. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's not really in my forte, but uh, I just go, can my beard, do I feel my beard touching it? Oh, well, and it's, and that's it's where for I draw the people the too, you know? I mean, yeah. that's why Joe is such a big advocate for uh, his guests wearing headphones is so they know. They know what they like, sound hey, like. hey, we're doing an audio show here. This is number yep. one, just for the people. Now, we're very fortunate. We also have a very tantalizing fire going next to us, but. Um, well, it is very aesthetically pleasing. Oh, hey. <laughs> It's nice to have that crackle, too. The audio levels on the thing are just perfect. You can just hear the crackle in the background. Oh, I had this little peachy in a while. I love peach. Does yours fizz or no? A little bit. Yeah, it's a little fizzy. I don't know why they do that. Well, it's probably sparkling water or something in here. But I don't know why it's about peach. I just love peach. I really do. Yeah, peach is a great flavor. Mm, love the peach. Yeah. We're looking uh, to bring on an energy drink sponsor in 2024. Wouldn't that be lovely? <laughs> if you know one. Yeah. Well, I just ordered I, some I, I Jocko Go. I'll bring some of that. We'll try. We'll try. Yeah, I've I've had some of his before. I've been at different events where there's oh, a really? bunch of it. And my neighbor uh, up at the property, Yeah, he works with Jocko through uh, Echelon. Mm-hmm. And he's always got cases of that sitting around his house. Yeah. So he'll frequently hand me something or whatnot. Mm-hmm. But it's, yeah, it's, it's not bad at all. I mean, all of them have, you know, their own different kind of taste. Um, I try. I try not to drink energy drinks. In fact, I think the only time I ever sit down and have one is when we're mm. doing this. Um, but man, they are tasty these days. They, Clean they, ingredients. Yeah. 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 I just wonder what you know when you don't know what this stuff is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you wonder is this? Well, this is like caffeine on crack mm. or not? You know. Yeah, I worry a little bit about the long term results of them because you know energy drinks are relatively new, right? We don't have yeah. people who've been drinking energy drinks for fifty years, right? But you do have 20-year-olds having a heart attack. <laughs> so there's that, but they drank like 12 of them in a row or something. Yeah, I mean, it, it's like anything. It can get a little out of control. Um, those and, uh, you know, what's hot now is like Zins. Yeah. People throwing a Zin Nicotine in. Nicotine instead of a yeah. chew. Yeah. Did you ever chew? I did for a about a year. I smoked longer than I chewed <laughs> right. from like, yeah. Well, my dad was a smoker, yeah. like heavy, and... I started being sitting in on managers' meetings when I was, I think, 15, and every manager smoked. And it was yeah. in a sealed one-door, one-window office, and they didn't even open the window, and everybody just fucking smoked away nonstop. <laughs> there was it's like, wow, I might as well be smoking at this point. But um, I think I was 17. I wish and there was I, a camera on the wall for that. Was... Oh, God. <laughs> So, so different bad. Different times, man. Like, it, it, it aged me quickly. <laughs> Very different um, times. You it got was. wrinkles. <laughs> you got your class, yeah, you got right. wrinkles. Yeah. Like, dude, you couldn't even hardly see the guy across the room. And this is a small room. Like, it was bad. That's how you knew it was a good meeting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nobody ever wanted to leave. Yeah. yeah. I got used to it really quick. But, um, no, I smoked from uh, 17 to 20, I think it was 22. 21, 22, somewhere in there. And the biggest, um, biggest challenge for me to to officially stay quit was um drinking so if i if i had like two beers dude i would murder somebody for a cigarette at that yeah. point it was very hard to quit uh and eventually i quit both and i quit drinking for a long time yeah um but i, I once i quit both it, it was, was a simultaneous they were about a month apart or two months apart yeah somewhere in there and once i once i quit um drinking not smoking was pretty easy but i i've never stopped wanting a cigarette like really? i still i'm i'm 44 i quit when i was 21 somewhere around there um and mind you this was you could smoke in a bar you know you wouldn't have like designated areas or yeah anything like that. smoking was pretty much upon. acceptable anywhere yeah um and i um yeah i i, I still want one it's been, and i haven't touched one like i quit and i did not touch another cigarette i didn't take a drag off of somebody's or nothing i i've probably had a dozen cigars over the years don't really care for them that much but every once in a while i'll get Do you inhale into it. them uh, I try not to, but yeah. out of my previous habits, that's what I'm that's used what to I doing. That's what I wonder, yeah. Yeah, but either way, I didn't uh, I didn't really enjoy it all that much. I'd, I'd do it here and again, but it never made me go, God, I need a cigarette, you know? So I don't think I was quite getting the, the same thing. 
Um, but, and I don't think in, in general, they're terrible for you if you're only having one once in a while, you know, just like anything else. Like you can have a, a glass of wine here and there and it's not going to kill you. That kind of thing. Sometimes in, in, sometimes exposing your body to toxins and things like that in small quantities is beneficial. But um, I've, I've never stopped wanting a cigarette. Like I still walk by somebody where people go, oh, that's gross. And I still go, oh my God, I can't believe I used to smell like that. Mm -hmm. But I still want one. And I'll probably die wanting one. But I'm never touching mm -hmm. one again. Because that was, I've never experienced anything or ingested anything that I wanted, I felt like I needed so badly mm -hmm. after that. You know, which I wasn't ever much of a drug user by any means. You know, I was very, very, very little. Clean um, cut. Yeah, yeah. I, I drank and I drank a hearty amount, especially in my <laughs> late teens and early twenties, like you know most boys do probably or did. Um, but yeah, it's tobacco was terrible, like really, really hard. To yeah, I used to right? chew, and it's the hardest thing I've ever quit. Yeah, it, it's it, very difficult. It hangs on to you. And one of the other thing that kills me about it is once you're having it regularly, it doesn't really do anything. No. But it just makes you want it. It's just a ritual. Yeah, it's a ritual that has like some withdrawal <laughs> issue. And nicotine, nicotine is very difficult to quit. Um, I would associate it with playing golf, going on road trips, and it was really hard. It's the hardest thing I've ever quit. I I don't now want one. I see people use Zins, and I'm like, that'd be interesting just to try. But I'm like, I don't want to reintroduce having to requit nicotine. Right. Yeah. Because. Yeah. If it if it hits you anything like uh, chew or cigarettes do, mm -hmm. fuck that. Because you're going to have me. a hard time quitting. And, no, it's amazing how many people I know are on some kind of nicotine. Mm -hmm. Like, a a amazing. Yeah, Zins have gotten popular really fast. Yeah. Have you ever seen Grinds? It's like a coffee version of Zins. Uh, no. I, like, I, I don't pay attention yeah. to it. So I always thought those would be interesting, too. But, again, I don't, I don't want to reintroduce trying to quit any of that stuff. Um, yeah, why put yourself in that position if you manage to get out of it? Yeah. It doesn't, like, it doesn't help you with anything. Yeah. Like, I, I at least understand alcohol because it'll take your edge off. It'll chill you out. It'll calm you down within reason. Yeah. Um. So I get why people would continue to drink and not be like, this is stupid. I'm never doing this again. But tobacco just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I agree. But, you know, a lot of people that work on the road or work yeah. blue-collar jobs, it's really easy to, you know, throw in a chew and help the day go along. And, yeah, man, it can become part of that ritual. And it's, it's just a, freaking hard to quit. It's a... Reduces your appetite. Uh, yeah, I think that's part. No, of nicotine it. actually has all sorts of health benefits. It nicotine yeah, itself. If, yeah, itself. Yeah, but all the other things you introduce, not not so good. And um, that's where, like, if a person could use ins now, like I think our friend Drew had tried them or something, and because for the nicotine benefit, because he's like a closet health nut. Um, oh yeah, very much. But <laughs> I, I don't appreciate know. that I about mean, Drew. Yeah, me too. It's always intriguing to me to what what's the new ne new healthy thing because I frequently feel unhealthy. Yeah, I always I like having eccentric friends or friends that are doing different shit or weird stuff. Or, mm -hmm. um, yeah, Drew definitely falls into that category, and that's one thing I really appreciate about him. You know what else is hard to quit? What else is hard to quit? Tim? Listening to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hope so. We got a good bump, didn't we? Yeah, you know you're saying. Yeah, we got a recent bump, and um, guys, we would appreciate it very much if you would subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening to it, and uh, leave it a review or leave us a comment. That stuff really does help us, and we want to get to 5K by Christmas. That would sure be nice, considering that's, that's, that's your... what we asked for originally, <laughs> and we still ain't got that it. That is your Christmas gift to us. You don't have to send us any weird dildos in the mail. That would be lovely. <laughs> None of that stuff. <laughs> Just hit a subscribe Ooh. button or leave us a review, and um, yeah, we appreciate that. And if you guys want to get your greasy little mitts on some archery gear, Josh has the website, portymarcher.com. What, what? Insert sound effect. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I have a discount code. It's just Tim C. It'll get you 10% off all the stuff. Yeah, we literally need 167 new subscribers, people, by Christmas. Is that all? No, more than that. No, we're at 48, 33. Oh, we got a good bump. Yeah, yeah. You guys are crushing it. So yeah, maybe, you know, we'll get there. Maybe we'll crush through that. Anyway, it helps, guys. It really does. Um, you know, we've actually had a pretty blessed year. 600 599 subscribers in the last was that 28 days that they put those off of yeah 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 
109 had, more than usual. We've had says. a pretty blessed year in a lot of different ways, but um, as far as bow hunting goes, I think I just closed out my uh, my favorite year, my best year of bow hunting. You think so? Yeah. Yeah, I started with a spring bear, got a good spring bear, had a heck of an adventure hunt, incredibly difficult hunt in Nevada, mm-hmm. very low densities, was able to connect on an uphill steep shot that'll forever be ingrained in my memory. Mm-hmm. Um, I felt like that shot was a shot I watched a lot of hard work pay off, and uh, it was just really, really cool. And then recently, you know, whitetail hunting these last couple of years is, I have mixed feelings about it because other things draw my attention. But every year, about the beginning of November, I'm just like, I'm a whitetail hunter. Right. I got to go home whitetail. And it's something I start to get really, really excited about. And I was able to uh, connect on a, like a nice Washington whitetail buck. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And you, uh, who, who do you want to go first? You want to go? You can go first. You're good. Okay. Yeah. So we're gonna go in the long form version of this story. Um, I grew up a whitetail hunter. That is where my roots in bow hunting came from. I was like 11 years old, preparing to hunt when I was 12. Mm-hmm. Had a shitty little bow. I would go home after school, and I remember shooting at 15 yards. And um, I don't know. I felt like at that age, I had some kind of natural skill or talent for archery. Mm-hmm. I felt like I was pretty competent. For the age group. Um, and nobody in very few people in my area were bow hunting. Right. It wasn't cool. People didn't know about it. It was very uncommon. Most people in my area rifle hunted. But because I could hunt at 12 with a bow, I was driven to bow hunt before I could rifle hunt at 14. Mm-hmm. So I initially kind of grew this love for bow hunting because I could get close to animals and like I would like rip behind my house after school and go run baits. And um, I was kind of doing it all full circle at that age to be to try to punch a tag. And I did stack up some kills in high school. Um, I never killed anything real big or real old with my bow, but I shot quite a bit of stuff. And um, that was initially where my kind of my itch and appreciation for archery came from. And what I always appreciated at that age was just being close. Yeah. Like you saw things, you were close to animals. It was always challenging to get your bow drawn back. Mm-hmm. And uh, I really appreciated that challenge. And if that's what you start with, you, that's just kind of what you know. You don't, you just figure it out. Right. You know, you don't, you don't rifle hunt because you can't rifle hunt. You just figure out how am I going to get close and Yeah. I always liked at that time, too, not having trail cameras now that I look back. Mm -hmm. There's something about, like, the mystique of going out into the woods and not knowing. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely a different thing there, and it's it's been spoiled. I remember the first first product we ever had that resembled that. Um, My dad got what they called him a – oh, it was a trail timer. You remember trail timers? No. So it was a clock that that you strung a, a line across a trail. Yeah. So when a critter walked over it and sprung it, you knew what time they were walking by. And it could only trip once? Could only trip once. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it could only trip once. And that was back when I was, well, I think like 10, 11 years old when we mm-hmm. first started. Uh, we did a lot of bear baiting when I was a kid because that used to be legal in uh, Washington and Idaho. Mm-hmm. It's still legal in Idaho, not legal in Washington anymore. Um, but we spent a ton of time in the spring because you could hunt spring in Idaho and then in the fall doing that. And that was one of the products that we had used. So you at least had an idea what time they were walking So you guys by. were baiting uh, six months of the year, four months of the year for yeah. bear. Yeah. Well, the season season was only like the spring season in Idaho was still where we were. We were only 30 days, and you could only put out bait um, two weeks before, if I remember right. Um, and then the fall season was way longer, and you could run that a lot. But you're also trying to deer hunt then because I also grew up a white-tailed deer hunter. Like mm-hmm. that's what I started at as well. As a young man, very, I think I started. What hunting. was the age you were allowed to first bow hunt? I started bow hunting at nine. Um, didn't have any luck, which, you know, looking back on it, it was um, it was my dad and just dropped me off in a tree and then taken off and going somewhere else. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I don't think he, uh, I don't think he put a ton of care into it. Like he left me alone, like frequently. Like <laughs> I, I was alone at mm-hmm. eight, nine years old in the woods by myself. Those are different times. All the time. Like, all the time. Those are very different times. Um, but he, the first year, I think it was just something to 
occupy me while he was hunting. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the next year, I, I hunted with a rifle and hunted one, my first evening and shot a buck with a rifle. Mm. Um, Over bait or? No, no, just coming out into a field. This was before anybody even knew about baiting, mm. right? Because, I mean, we're talking about 35 years ago, right? Long time. Wasn't what it is today. You can close that, I think. Do you remember what rifle yeah. you used? Yeah, I have it. It's right in there. It's a Ruger 270 uh, Winchester. Oh, what a classic yep. caliber, man. Yeah, 270. It had a Leupold uh, Very X2, Very X3, three, three and a half to 10. That's a good scope, too. And a uh, Harris bipod. It's wood stock and uh, an old leather sling. And I laid up over a log and put the bipod down and grenaded his heart at 250 yards. And okay. I only shot the gun like 10 times. Um, and then that was the end of my rifle hunting for deer. Like, How big of a deer was that? Oh, it was a non-typical funky thing. It wasn't. Mm. It was like a. It looked like a three-point with eight points. Mm-hmm. Like a little thing, but it was a legal buck, and that's all we were trying to do is get my feet wet. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was at ten, and then I hunted deer thereafter with a bow, and I harvested a deer every year. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to remember. Was it always age. one tag in Washington? One yeah. tag. It's always only ever been one, one tag as long as I've been alive. Yeah. One tag, period. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, they were doing a draw for a second doe tag for a while, and originally that draw was really easy. Like, almost everybody got it. If it was archery, you were like 80%, 90%. I think 10 years ago, everybody got it still almost. Yeah. Well, uh, that's kind of the timeline I'm thinking Mm -hmm. of, 10 to 15, uh, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, It's hence gotten a lot harder. But, yeah, it used to be really easy to get two, but that was the only way you could get two. You had to draw a second one, and it was a doe only. There wasn't a second one you could Mm -hmm. shoot a buck with or anything like that. Um, but yeah, that was, uh, so like I said, similar, similar background in, you know, tree stand deer hunting. And I did that for whitetail hunting for 10 years or so. Do you, do you remember like, were you able to go run the baits on your own or was your dad out? Did he have to help? Well, at a certain point I had to be able to drive. Yeah. Right. So, um, I think from once I was driving, I so because my dad owned a, the sporting goods store, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and he, if I remember, I'm trying to remember when it shifted, but he went from working a lot to hardly working at all. Like he was just, his business was running, it was running itself. Um, and he wasn't there very often. So if I remember right, and I was working there a lot, once I could, once I could drive, I was working five, six days a week. Mm-hmm. Um, so at that point he kind of did it himself, but frequently if he was baiting or, Running out and doing that, I was going with him, but not by myself because I couldn't drive. And you um, were stacking up bears at this time too, right? Yeah, I shot uh, two bears a year for a while there. Um, yeah. But when, once they outlawed baiting in Washington, which I think I was a, a teen, I think I was 16 or 15 or 17, um, when they outlawed it in Washington, we quit doing it because we had this, we, we hunted the border. Yes. And then you would put baits like on the state line, you'd find the markers, right? And then put your bait right on the state line. And then put a tree stand in either state. Yeah. So I'm standing in this state, but you're only baiting one spot. So you could do, you know, same amount of work for two state hunting instead of one state hunting. And once they outlawed it in Washington, my dad just didn't want to do it anymore. Mm-hmm. It's like it's too much freaking work because baiting bears is a lot of work. It's a lot it of work. It is a ton of work. Yeah. And if you haven't done it, you have no idea how yeah. ridiculous of amount of work it's it is. It's not the easy button at all. It's definitely not something you should do by yourself, too. you got to have a partner that's going to split way, the work. Yeah. So you do it. Like, because if you have really active baits, you probably got to go twice a week mm-hmm. to put a decent amount of bait out yeah. enough, right? And so one of you does one time and one of you does the other time, yeah. and then you're only going once a week each. That's a pro tip. Yeah, well, and you got to, uh, and you got to, you know, find a decent supply of bait, period, which is not necessarily easy, nor is it super cheap. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's nice to find free stuff, but it's kind of hard to find free stuff because most of those uh, resources have been consumed by somebody else who's been doing it before if you're new to it. Mm-hmm. Um, I know in a in a pinch, um, dog food's one of the cheaper mm-hmm. options, just like cheap generic dog food. Um, but in general, you know, you can you can buy out the uh, the bakery's old stuff, like uh, like Franz will do that, and there's a couple others. But mm-hmm. but in general, it's very hard to find options, and a lot of that is uh, bought by pig farmers because they'll feed their pigs because it's the cheapest way to feed pigs. So mm-hmm. you're you're dealing with them too, like. A lot of times those options just aren't there and you're stuck with, you know, whatever you can scrounge up to try to bait. And you can't, like, throw out old game meat or anything like that because yeah. that's illegal. Uh, you I... can throw out old freezer burnt meat or that sort of thing. Um, one of my favorite things, which it was a, it was a hassle and a pain in the butt, was uh, shooting carp mm. and then yeah. use them for bait. 
yeah fish that 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 smell helps really good what i was yeah, gonna say though stinks. was like <laughs> it that was uh probably fast tracked a lot of your experience as well because hunting bears over bait is i don't know that it's harder than whitetail but it has parallels very and, much you know it's very it's a very scent aware situation and everyone's got a fear of bears right so to just be like a young man in the woods hunting bears i was i think that's probably was probably uh you're oh, not, forced you're not you to get comfortable real fast. Yeah, you're not afraid of bears, right? I would not at all. Yeah. That seems like a joke. Like the the number of times I was on my hands and knees following a blood trail in the middle of the night, uh, with my dad <laughs> wandering <laughs> off trying to s- skip the trail and yeah. find where he went because it was a not a great blood trail or something, mm-hmm. with no sidearm or anything. Yeah, like I'm I'm and I'm following a bear in the dark. Yep. with shit flashlights. Because the flashlights you got today are awesome. <laughs> like what I had, you could barely see. I don't know how I saw anything, but and yeah, just like crawling through brush and face, you know, six inches off the ground, trying to look for a speck of blood. Keep mm-hmm. making sure you're walking in the right direction because it was bear always tunnels through bear tunnels. It was thick, always it's thick around here, and they're not trails; they're tunnels. No, it's a tunnel, and they're nasty. And tunnel's you're like not built for you're a like human. on your belly. Yeah, like it's not good. Um, and he would frequently just jump ahead and find trails, you know, 30 yards ahead, 40 yards ahead, and try to find some blood on the trail so he could skip mm-hmm. and move farther ahead and leave me behind by myself on the trail. Yeah. Like, he could have walked past where the wounded bear was trying to find farther down the trail, and I'm walking up on a wounded bear, like, with no gun mm-hmm. at 10, 11, 12 years old. Like, I, I still remember, like, distinctly the first time he – I sat in a, in a stand by myself for bear, which, you know, you've – they got teeth and claws. Deer aren't as scary, right, as far as, like, getting attacked or something, right? Um, and I want to say I was 11. And I had to get out of the tree after dark with no flashlight. Wasn't allowed to turn on my flashlight. It's like, you can't turn on your flashlight. You can see your eyes will adjust. And he was right. They could. I could see. But, you know, kind of. Um, and then walked out a half mile down a logging road. Compass or no compass? No compass. No. No. But you no. had a logging road for reference. Yeah, I mean, they're on a road. Like, it, yeah. you're not going to screw it up. But yeah, I like a half hour after dark. Like, you don't get out of the tree until a half hour after dark. Make sure there's nothing underneath you. Mm-hmm. And somewhere around that half hour after dark mark, you can get out. And then I'll pick you up on the road down below at like 10, 11, 12, somewhere in there. Yeah. And that's... after after that one, like, I, a branch touched my face and I freaked the fuck out. <laughs> I thought I was getting mauled. Um, cause I didn't see it cause I wasn't allowed to turn a light on. Right. And you're just walking down a logging road and, um, it was, it was very spooky, but after that, none of it seemed scary, mm-hmm. which so he, in hindsight, he may have been, you know, may have been right. Breaking me. Yeah. And just get it over with. Cause this is how it's going to be. And now I'd look at somebody that turns their flashlight on. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. You can see, you don't need that. We can walk out of here just fine. As a father, that's gotta be an interesting decision when you're like, Hey, I'm gonna break this kid a little bit, or when you're gonna push him a little further than you oh, know, he that's always, his comfort zone. He you know? always wanted to break me. <laughs> like it was, and and I'm thankful for it, man. I uh, really am, because at the time, you know, it's funny. I, I I still remember, um, talking at his funeral, and not realizing all the stuff he was probably trying to do until he died. You know, not realizing what it was or what it meant, or, and then all of a sudden, it's it's like it all flooded in. And that that you know, a couple of weeks before his funeral, after he died, and um, even if that wasn't what he was doing, that's how I see it. Like mm-hmm. he was he was making me a stronger person, mm-hmm. like an authentically stronger person, um, and making me be uncomfortable and making me what's the word? Um, refusing to be content because not I, I'm always trying to change something, trying to do something better trying to push for improvement. Um, and it's because of that, because it was never good enough for him. Like, he, it was always like, you're up 30% and you want to know why you weren't up 40%. Mm-hmm. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that that's, that's how it was. And because of that, I, I really believe I am who I am. And I push, like I push, and I'm making different products and changing different things because it's not good enough and it needs to be better. And if I need to do it, then so be it. Um but yeah, I, I I relate all that back to that. So I'm thankful that he made me climb out of a tree in the dark at way too young, 
and you're not allowed to turn on a flashlight in in bear country where you they're you're literally they're trying to come right where you are and you're walking out of that by yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, I cu- I couldn't fathom probably trying to make my kids do that, but maybe I should have. Yeah, as an I think as an outdoorsman, it it's you can look and see some. Hey, some of my most valuable life's lessons have been facilitated from being outdoors. Sure. Whether that's hunting, fishing, navigating, surviving, uh, a lot of those life lessons can very are very well taught and facilitated outdoors. And I look and I see and I, I recognize that too. You know, mm-hmm. I can remember as a young man uh, getting lost in the woods and in very small parcels. You know, just like walking into some thicker, what you call it, like whippy brush. And get in 100 yards, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, I don't know how to get out of here. Yeah. You know, and then you have a moment of panic, and yeah. you make it out to be more than it is. And, you know, I could have walked 400 yards any direction and hit a landmark, but at the moment it just felt, you know, I'm hosed, I'm lost, uh, everything looks the same. I don't know which direction I came in from. I don't have a compass. Well, um, it's an experience that's lost today because everyone has Onyx. Right. right you can pull out your phone and there's, there's a trail you're walking on. Yeah. Like, it's right in your hand. Yep. And, like, take that thing away from you. Like, you you take half of the hunters in the wood today and take their Onyx away, they couldn't find anything because you didn't, you haven't learned how to. It's like, it's like navigating, right? It's like taking a trip somewhere and trying to go find it mm-hmm. without your phone. Like, the, the art is lost in the modern world, like, I remember going to, oh, uh, I think it was Canyon, was it Cannon Beach or one of the ones on the Oregon coast mm-hmm. before navigation and whatnot, and I was reading a map. <laughs> right, yeah. Right, and I understood how to read a map. Yeah. Like, you, somebody can't read a map anymore. Yeah. You know, no different than no understanding your landmarks, understanding your topo- topography, paying attention to your area and your environment, and knowing which directions you need to go in general. That's lost on people today. Very much so. Because you've got the little cheater in your pocket. <laughs> yeah. I don't even think about it anymore, too. I just go, oh, I'll just pull up my yeah. Oh, yeah, there I am. Cool. I always think about, like, uh, Larry Jones and Dwight Shue and, like, their big elk hunts. Mm. And they were just doing it via landmark, you know, via yep. old school navigation. Yep. Um, where I grew up, I mean, in the Midwest, there, it was big woods that you could roam a long ways. But it was nothing like the mountains out here. Yeah. Right. I mean, still today in the mm-hmm. mountains, a lot of ways you could go 10 miles and not hit anything. Mm-hmm. And um, man, I just think that was pretty cool. Pioneers of uh, pioneers of the sport of bow hunting. Well, there's very simple rules if you get lost and don't you realize that you're not going to die. It's it's not as scary, but you go always walk downhill, find a water source, follow that water source to a larger water source, you'll find people. Yeah. No matter what. It's just, it's a fact of life. You'll find civilization. Yeah, the creeks so. drain to the valleys, and the valleys have farmers, right? <laughs> That's just the reality of it. Yeah. Like, if you get lost in the woods, walk downhill, find water, mm-hmm. follow the water downstream, eventually it works into bigger water. And then wherever there's bigger water, there's people. Mm-hmm. So you'll find your way out. Yeah. Which I think that was, I mean, whatever Bears Grill show was, that's what, like, always the guideline rule. But that was what I was taught when I was little. If you get lost, you can't find me, mm-hmm. walk downhill, find water, Follow the water down downstream to bigger water. Mm-hmm. You'll find people. You're not going to die. Yeah. So. Yeah. And don't stop moving. Yeah. If you're if you're cold, don't stop moving. That's Just fact. keep walking, no yeah. matter what. Don't sit down. Don't rest. Keep moving. Yeah. Um, not to get too off on a tangent, but I've always heard Aaron Snyder talk about navigating too, and he always talks about uh, I don't know some military system. For how to navigate, and I've always been curious to like learn more about exactly how those guys do that because I'm sure it's more precise. Well, I know they do that um, that glassing academy thing. I wonder if they go over that. In yeah. That. I don't know what that's called, but that was that's a really neat idea, mm-hmm. like teaching people how to functionally glass for animals correctly. Yeah, I mean, Western hunting is it's mostly glassing. That. Depends yeah. on where you are, but mostly. It's glassing. Yeah, it's I, locating. And it's not my strong suit. Yeah. Like I, I would I would entertain going through that just yeah. to try to learn better skills in that because it's super important. I mean, which is why good glass is so important, which is why people spend so much money on good quality glasses, because you'll pick out things, 
in good quality glass that you won't pick out in worse quality. And you don't really know if you're a mediocre glasser or whatever until you hunt with somebody who's a good glasser. Yeah. And they're sitting next to you and they're like, oh, you see that? Oh, you see this? And you're like, wait, you're spotting three animals to my one. You yeah. know, imagine how much that adds up over the course of a season. Right. You know what I mean? Oh, it's drastic. Yeah. yeah. Like I I definitely need to spend time learning how to do that better because that big, is not one of A big part of glassing for me is just mentally being staying in it and knowing like that is the thing that's going to change the game. Like all, you only got to find one mature animal. So stay in it. Look, keep looking, keep looking. It's, it's, it's hard for me to, because I want to scan the hillside, put my glass down, you know? Yeah. But, um, no, there are no deer here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On to the next spot. Um, anyway, all that side story is just, just to say is like, I, I learned, uh, to hunt at a young age. That's where I learned and loved bow hunting. And whitetail was my first love. So Western hunting has always been like a very romantic idea to me. And it's been very fun, but I feel like my roots will always be in whitetail hunting. Mm -hmm. And, um, at this spot, I've been hunting now, particularly this exact spot. I have a five-year history. My first year, I think I got set up right before season. And on opening day, I saw a nice five-by-five. Five. He was probably two and a half or three and a half years old. Um, just like a beautiful Washington five-by-five, five, like a 130-inch buck. Probably was going to blow up in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, didn't get a shot at him. Hour later, I have this... Big chocolate horn, four by four, go cruising by my ground blind. I didn't stop him, didn't get a shot. That was an old deer, like four and a half, five and a half year old deer. And the next day I sat and I shot this broken horned uh, five by five. Mm -hmm. Nice, probably three and a half year old deer. Um, but that being said, I saw three bucks, no does, two days of sitting. I felt like I'd never had white tail hunting like that before in my life where I'd seen more does than bucks or more bucks than does. And um, I was like, man, this spot's going to be awesome forever. What a great spot. And uh, it just like slowly, the next year was pretty good. I shot uh, a nice five by five, my biggest buck. Uh, but I didn't see as many old deer on camera. Didn't mm -hmm. have as much on inventory. And I had a whole year to, to kind of observe what was there. The following year was a blue tongue year. Yeah. Blue tongue is a disease that comes around when uh, it's particularly, it happens in our area when we get low on water. Mm -hmm. And I guess it hits the oldest deer the hardest. Yeah. Now, I, I would like to do a little more research on just the biology of what is blue tongue and how it specifically affects animals. But my education on it is it's always been that it hits the oldest deer the hardest. They typically need more water. Yeah. And um, it's transferred at these water sources, and that's that's how these deer pass blue tongue or whatever. But what it felt like to me happened that year was the older deer did pass off. And I I thought maybe it was from bow hunting pressure in the area, but as I look back now, I think it was probably blue tongue. Yeah. And I just didn't see a really old deer for probably the next two years. And so fast forward to this year, I moved my stand around a little at the beginning of the year because I wanted to be more in the center of this landowner's um, property lines. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to have to deal with uh, a recovery that was potentially off his property. Sure. So in the early season, I didn't have anything exciting show up. And I was kind of bummed. I was like, man, you know, maybe it was my stand location. Could be. I don't know. Uh, it just, I wasn't seeing the bucks that I was so used to seeing. Even if they weren't big bucks, there was always bucks. The mm -hmm. buck to door ratio has always been good. So I moved my stand location and, and camera location in the beginning of November. Mm -hmm. I was like, hey, I'm going to make, make a little bit like a Hail Mary. I'm just going to change my locations, see if this increases activity. And I also put out a mock scrape. And the mock scrape turned out to be the best thing that I've never done because it really increased the rut activity in my area. Yep. I started to see competition next to that scrape. I had bucks coming up, hitting the licking branch above the scrape. And I had more rubs and scrapes in the area than I had ever seen before, mm -hmm. all within a couple hundred yard proximity. And I think that was because of the mock scrape. Now, I can't say for sure that it was. Oh, I guarantee it was. Yeah. My, my buddy Dave's a real big advocate for that. And he uses um, whatever that brand is, the Synthetic Scent Company. Yeah, I used a popular. Synthetic Scent, um, and I don't know the brand for it. I wish I did. 
Um, it was some shitty cheap one. I didn't even know if it was going to work, but I was at Sportsman's and I was like, whatever, I'm going to pick this up. I'll make a mock scrape. I'll make it easy. I'm not going to complicate it. And uh, yeah, like after I sent my camera in that mock scrape, I had a buck there four hours later. Yeah, I know. Um, I'm trying to get the name here of what um, it is. Buck Fever Synthetics. I know. A, yeah, that's the one I'm That's the of. one. Uh, yeah, we actually carry that. We um, have a local guy in our area who. Troy. Troy, yeah. He's, yeah, Troy Pottinger is big He's on very that. well known for um, yeah. being a great whitetail yeah. hunter, and he endorses Buck Fever Synthetics. Well, what I, was, what I was saying before is my buddy Dave, he's always baited and mm -hmm. whatnot. And when he started messing around with that brand um, and setting up cameras where there is a bait and a licking branch and they were relatively close by and cameras are pointed at both the activity on the camera with the licking branch was five times as much as the bait dang and he had many deer that he that never set a foot on his bait that went to the licking branch and they were only like 20 yards apart yeah so mock scrapes and licking branches are legit really effective and there's I think there's states where they're not legal. Like the, yeah. you can't use scents and things like that. Think, in fact, um, I think Minnesota, you can't use scent. It's scent in general or artificial scent? I can't use scent in general. Oh, that sucks. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you can't use scent in general. But yeah. I, I remember that being a, a a sticking point. But I think you can have a, a licking branch. Hmm. So, But you um, can't have scent. So my uh, bait is on my left. So I like to. I've always liked to shoot over my left side because I can draw my bow back and have like a good tee. Is mm -hmm. that how you set your bait as well? Yeah. My bait's always over there. Yeah. So yep. bait's on my left, and then this mock scrape is 90 degrees to the right. And I just had, like, this perfect tree there for it, and that's kind of what inspired the idea. I wasn't going into there thinking I was going to put a mock scrape, but I was like, you know what? That looks like there would be a scrape here. Let's put one here. I just made it with a branch exactly like you think you would. Put some of this scent in there. It was just a powdered scent. And um, just the rut activity in the area increased after that. There was a now a scrape line a couple hundred yards away. There were more rubs showing up every time I showed up. And uh, I definitely didn't see as much traffic on the branch cam as I did on the bait cam. But I saw bucks coming in to check that. And it feels like it created a central hub for competition. Yes. And, um, yeah, I think that was a game changer. But anyway, this leads up to the opener. Hunted the opener, didn't hardly see anything, saw one doe, um, wasn't discouraged. And the reason I wasn't discouraged is because of my history now in Washington. I have five, six, seven years of running trail cameras during the rut or during late bow season. And what I've always seen is these butts become, bucks become irregular, but what they'll often do is they'll often cruise midday. Yeah, I've killed almost all my bucks midday, not low light. And... Um, those first couple of days in our late season can be really dynamic in the middle of the day. And obviously that would depend on what you're hunting over, right? If, I mean, if you're hunting a field, you're probably not going to see midday cruisers. Maybe you will. I don't know. But I always tend to be more in the woods and a more bedding area type situation. So I wasn't discouraged not seeing anything the first day. Hunting the second day, saw one doe right at dusk, something like that. Wasn't discouraged. Went out the third day. Had two, uh, I would, I call them cute does because they were like, maybe a year and a half year old does. They weren't yeah. old. They were cute. They fed around. And one stayed in the bait while the other one was feeding around my perimeter just on the natural grass. And she was feeding behind me, but I could still see both of them out of both of my eyeballs. And I heard a weird noise. And I was like, that's a doe bleat. I've never heard a doe bleat in real life. This is my first time hearing it, but... Mm -hmm. Um, I'll make it, I'll make the sound that I can replicate for you guys, but it was soft. It was like, meh, soft. And maybe 30 seconds later, another, meh. And I could see her and I saw that she was froze up and I could hear crunching. So I was like, oh, cool. We got another player here. Hopefully it's a buck. Yeah. Um, should be a buck. Who knows? And he was coming from my blind spot, spot that I wouldn't have expected, of course, and as I looked over my left shoulder, I could hear the crunching. He first appeared to me at like five yards. Yeah. Right underneath me, you know. And at five yards, you can't just like grab your bow and be like, I mean, you know, I wasn't prepared to do that. But he did feed into the bait, towards the bait, was definitely flirting with this other doe that was in the bait. So she had his attention. And I was able to get my bow drawn back. It was funny when I drew back my bow. It was kind of like... I would call it like a weenie draw. Like 
I was cold. I was wearing so many <laughs> layers. I had sat all day and I was like, oh, I might have even bicep drew it a little bit. Like, oh. But as soon as, I, and I kind of had to turn my head to get it drawn back. But then as soon as I turned my head back, he hadn't moved. And I like looked at my housing, looked at my bubble, all of my pins were on him. It's like 14 yards. I think he was slightly quarter to me, probably 20 feet below me. My stand was only like 16 feet up, but my bait was probably four feet below that stand. Mm -hmm. Shot broke off. Um, I think I worked through the trigger pretty well, actually, on that shot. And I heard a loud, just whop, loudest impact I've ever heard. Yep. And uh, I could see my arrow sticking in the ground on the backside of him. He ran 30 yards. So full pass through. Yeah, mm -hmm. full pass through. Um, he ran 30 yards, stood up, very tipsy, kind of hung out, tipped over, took his last breaths. I've never had a deer pass out that close to me. I felt like that was a very heavy, heavy moment. Um, I could hear him expire. And, uh, yeah, I was very happy. It was the number one buck I would have liked to have shot out of there. Um, I think it was a three-and-a-half-year-old deer. It was just like a nice Washington buck. It wasn't massive. But the, the good news is th I think there's like four or five other three-and-a-half-year-old deer in there now. Yeah. And they should all make it through the season. And um, I think that area is going to cycle into another really good cycle um, with good competition from older deer. Sure. So tagged out, late season. Best recovery process I've ever been a part of. Um, I shot it with my bow, which was like 72 pounds, 440 grain arrow, Grim Reaper, Carna 4 broadhead, which is a four-blade mechanical made by Grim Reaper. I think it's a 125 head, but my total weight was 440. And uh, clean pass through, went through both shoulders, not hit bone, but through both shoulders, stuck in the ground, covered with lung blood. I didn't do the full autopsy because I go gutless, mm -hmm. but best recovery process I've been a part of. So all that said is um, very grateful to be tagged out and also happiest I've been with uh, like their recovery process. Lots of spray. Um, lots of damage, mm -hmm. arrow energy through the animal was good. Um, I was conscious through the shot process for the most part until the final, final break of the trigger. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was cool. Yeah, it was good. Nice. So happy to be tagged out. Heck yeah. Kind of put the icing on the cake for a really nice year. Right on. Yeah. Good deal, man. Yeah, it felt good. Felt good. Now, um, you also kind of have a long story about uh, your property. So yeah, I've um, I've been working on and trying to create more of a hunting specific property. Do you want to um, um, for four years now? Post the GPS coordinates down in the notes for everybody to it's come. private, dude. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I can say that it is uh, it is a lot harder than I originally thought. Like the uh, the the previous place that i'd hunted in washington was my buddy's place and i helped him cultivate it to uh to a good positive relatively easy to harvest uh an elk every year or yeah. dang near every year um you know you're not shooting a monster or nothing and sometimes you're shooting a cow but you're filling a a tag which is with a lot of meat in, in a state, a state that's, that's kind of hard to kill an elk very in. difficult to do um so it, and it was it worked out really well for a long time and hard times came and he needed to sell it and I couldn't quite swing buying it myself or I would have, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and couldn't find a situation that worked. So then thus I was out of a place to hunt. And, um, that year I ended up having to hunt on my buddy's place that I didn't uh, manage to produce anything, but you know, I was fortunate to have an opportunity. And then the next spring, um, I bought a chunk of land with a buddy of mine that, um, had the same idea. And bought 80 acres and, you know, happened to occasionally have elk in there, which was great. And But nothing, like, snazzy or special. And then uh, the following year, the next 80 acres next door to me became for sale. And I bought it myself. Um, so now we got 160. And then there's, there's almost no other land available that isn't, like, National Forest or Timber Company mm -hmm. around. So it – and it's the last dirt – 
up the road mm -hmm. before you hit National Forest. So it's as close as you could get. And buying it originally, I was like, well, I guess we'll just hunt on the National Forest if we can't make this work. Mm -hmm. But we've got a, a an access point from where which to branch off from. So, and it's been four years, and uh, I can say that every year I have had an opportunity that I may have screwed up, or my timing might have been wrong, or I might have not been there when I should have, or, you know, zig when you should have zagged, that yeah, kind of thing. Kind of the short of that story is you would always leave, and then it would be like, damn it. There's a great example. I've got yeah. a great example. Um, this year, in uh, early season, um, I hadn't seen an elk on camera in almost three weeks. So I was very discouraged. And it was hot and dry, which abnormally hot and dry for up there. Um, and so I was like, well, screw it. I, I got up there, and um, my buddy had actually an elk showed up, um, and he, uh, he shot a cow low. And we couldn't find her. Um, and walked all over Helen Gone for a day. Mm. Like, blew everything out of there. Guaranteed. So I was like, well, screw it. Um, I, I was waiting for the uh, the title to be delivered so I could do a bow review on it. And it didn't show up before I had to leave. It was supposed to show up before I had to leave so I could do it, have it all booked in and ready to go. And it would launch when it's supposed to launch. And I wouldn't have to be in, in town. Um, so after like not seeing anything for two days, I went, screw it. I'm going to drive back to town. I have enough time to come home, film it, edit it, put it out, have it launch on time and then go back and hunt. The day I was back here, there was elk on camera during the daylight where I would have been sitting. So like I said, there's always been an opportunity. It's just for one reason or another, it didn't work out. Mm -hmm. Um, and it rolls around to late season and a week before I start seeing, bull showing up on my camera, which it's bull only in late season up there. You can't shoot a cow. And so I'm getting pretty excited because I'm getting like daylight picks. And like it starts off by like two cows and a bull. And then before I before I get up there, it's like eight or nine cows and a bull. And then I didn't know it at the time, but there is an, on another camera of mine on the other side of my property, there's a picture of a bull. I'm like, oh, sweet. He, he's over there now. Well, I didn't look at it really thoroughly because I'm terrible at, look, at analyzing pictures. Uh, my buddy Nick, like, obsesses over him, so he's always looking at it. He's like, dude, that's a different bull. Like, are you sure? I mean, that's basically the same fra frame, rack, the whole bit, and blah, blah, blah. He's like, I think that's a different bull. He's like, ah, you're nuts. It's the same bull. Because he had, like, a, gar a gore on his uh, – above his back left hip mm. – or his right hip, excuse me, uh, where he looked like he'd been stabbed with an antler or something, like, where they were, they were fighting. Um, and – so I show up, I think that I, those pictures were like two days ahead of time or something like that. Uh, and then the camera stopped working. Like the main place that they were coming into, the camera just stopped taking pictures. It's like, well, that's weird. Like they're, they're solar, right? They're solar, rechargeable batteries, the whole thing. Like it shouldn't ever stop taking pictures. It's a cell phone camera, right? Well, it just stopped. It was bizarre. So leading up to going up there, and I've got this whole elaborate plan. I'm going to come in on opening day. I'm going to wait till it's daylight to go in, to drive in there. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to e-bike up the hill. Cause I've got a little, my little e-bike motorbike thing. So it's quiet, carry all my crap with me, um, and hike in the rest of the way, um, go sit in the, the blind the rest of the day that day, and then start, uh, hunting from before daylight till dark the day after. Well, I get in there and I can't. I, because I'm not getting pictures, I can't really see the, the the alfalfa that I had up there because of where things are positioned. I can't really see it. Uh, and I sit that evening and just a couple of does and a little buck chasing the does around. And, like, not even – they didn't even have a chance to eat. Like, he was running them all over hell and gone. You had a buck tag too, right? Yeah, but I've never seen a buck up there that's worth oh. shooting because it, it hasn't – there's too many predators. And until the predator thing gets under control – uh, and I have enough water around, it's not going to get better. So it'll, it'll get better eventually. It's just going to take time, assuming we don't get out, get told we can't hunt predators anymore. Then it's a whole different discussion of what I would do. But um, anyway, so I set that whole time, and the camera's still not working. So I go down, uh, and mind you, it's cold, like cold, cold. It's teens, probably, most of the time. There's a little bit of snow, not a lot. There was snow, part of it melted, and then it warmed back up. Um and then cooled off again and haven't had snow since. So I'm kind of crunching through snow, going in, going out, making a little bit of noise, but being as quiet as I can. There's a cut road all the way to where I'm going. That's an old log and skitter trail or whatnot, right? 
And so because I can't see, I don't know when, because I can't see a camera, I don't know if the elk are even there. I don't know if they're, because they're nomadic. They'll like go away for five days and then they'll come back. And I had the whole week till Thursday morning and I got up there on Saturday morning. And that's common for elk, by the way. That's normal. Yeah, that's totally no, normal. Nomadic behavior, yeah. Nomadic behavior is totally normal. I've experienced that for 15 years. Like mm-hmm. they'll be in a place for three, two, three, four days mm-hmm. and they disappear for two, three, four days, sometimes yeah. eight days. You just don't know. They yeah. just move around. Um, but anyway, I, so I, I went, all right, well, I can't, I can't see, so I don't know when they're going in there and I don't want to go up the hill in the dark and not be able to tell that they're in there ahead of time or not be able to glass from a distance to make sure they're not in there before I try to go in. So the next day I decide, okay, I'm not going in there till, you know, 11 o'clock to where I can see clear as day. It's midday. There's, I've never had any travel showing up of elk at, or between like 11 and 1230. I've never seen a picture. So I'm like, this is a safe window. This is when I have to go in there if I'm going to go in there. So the next day, do the same thing, go in there. Um, mind you, I'm off grid, so I don't have power and I have a battery bank and my battery bank had showed like 50% power when I shut everything off to go up the hill, figuring that I would give me enough power to get through the next day. Mm. And then after that, I was going to have to turn a generator on. At, what are you staying up there? I had a little camper, pickup camper. Camper, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's just, it's great for one person. It's everything you need to stay warm and dry. It's got a heater in it. It's got a little stove in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I just run and, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of it. It's, uh shoot uh, it'll come to me but uh like it's like an 85 pound battery yeah it holds power for two to three days and my heater re- requires electricity for the fan to run mm. so as if you lose power in the middle of the night the heat won't turn on get cold you get cold real fast get when cold. it was getting down into the i know in town it was like in the teens so up there it means single digits because my elevation's higher and there's nothing around i'm like you go out of my camper at night and you can't see a light and I can see a mile in almost any direction, and there's not a light. Like, I'm the only person there, which is cool. Uh, it's a very, very neat, humbling feeling. But in any event, um, so I, I've got 50% left on my battery bank, so I'm like, all right, well, I can make it till tomorrow. So I get, I go up and hunt again, don't see anything again. Like, no activity, no noise to speak of, deer moving around, but I haven't seen an elk. Still don't have a, the camera's still not working, and I still can't see the feed. So I come back down the hill and I call my buddy Nick after dark. And mind you, it's getting dark at like 4.30, 4.45, right? I come back down the hill and I go, all right, man, I don't know what to do. Like, it's been two days. I haven't seen anything. And I'm not panicking, but I have like six more bales of alfalfa down at camp. And I don't know if there's any alfalfa left up there, right? So I'm like, but the only way I'm getting up there is if I jump in my razor that I put the tracks on in case we got snowed in so you could get in and out in an emergency. Um... And it's going to make a crap load of noise. So I'm, I'm talking to him, and he's like, because uh, my, my initial gut is, okay, 10 o'clock tomorrow, I'm firing up the razor. I'm going to turn the, the, ge- the generator on at my property to recharge my battery bank. I'm going to make noise anyway. I've, I've got the razor on a trailer in my truck. I haven't unloaded it yet because it's going to make noise to unload it. I tried to come in as quiet as I could and make no noise the whole time. Mm-hmm. So I was like, well, I guess I'm, uh, I guess tomorrow, because I'm going to make noise anyway, I'm going to try doing this midday. And he goes, dude, if I were you, I would do it at nine o'clock at night. I'd do it nine o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night. I'm like, God, I don't know. What if they're in there at night? He's like, I don't know. But so my, my plan was to, uh, to go in there and do it the next day. Well, I'm sitting there watching a movie at like 830 at night and the, all the electricity shuts off. Mm-hmm. I'm like, what the hell? And go push my battery bank, and it says zero. I'm like, how in the heck did it go from 50 to 50% to zero in like two hours? When it would, that's normally two days worth of juice, right? So I'm like, well, I guess I'm making noise. So I got to go outside and turn a generator on. So I turn the generator on, plug in the battery bank, turn the heat back on in my, my camper, unload the razor, and went, well, he said I'd do it, to do it at nine or 10, so I'm going to do it anyway. Loaded up a, a bale of alfalfa. Um, and looked at the, the camera when I got up there. So I get up there at like almost 10 o'clock at night. I've got lights on. I've, it's making noise and whatnot. And all the, all the alfalfa is gone. Um, so I, I threw a bale of alfalfa in there and I threw a couple leaves up in the air, like chucked them up in the air to get scent in the air better because they can smell that crap a long ways away. Um, and go over and look at, this, at the game camera and the solar panel's facing down, mm. not up. So I'm like, it's not getting any charge. So I, fl- I fixed that get it facing upward, get it working right. 
and rip rip my butt back down the hill. Ended up staying up till probably eleven or twelve, letting everything charge fully, getting my battery bank back up to a hundred percent, and uh, fired everything down, repositioned the truck, and turned everything off. Went to bed. Um, still don't have pictures, so I'm not because it's going to need the daylight to charge it, right? So I'm like, well, I'm not going in there until like eleven o'clock again. So we're now on day three, wake up in the morning and eight o'clock I get pictures. Like, okay, that was what was wrong, right? And I get like three or four pictures. And so I'm, I'm pretty jacked. I'm like, okay, one way or another, I'm going to know if they're still here or not, right? So I'm going to know how cautious I need to be with noise because I'm not that far away. I mean, I'm a ways, but still, they, they got to be able to hear me down there, right? So I go ripping up the hill on my e-bike again, hike the rest of the way in, um, climb up into my, uh, into my blind and... I'm not even done like resituating my bow, getting my heater body suit out, <coughs> getting my layers on right, getting everything situated. And but I'm sitting down in my in my chair in the blind and out the left window I can see yellow. I turn and look and there's that bull. I can see the little gore mark in his hip. He's about a hundred yards off. Um and so I'm just dead silent, not moving. And granted, I'm in a like a tower blind. Like I, I don't think they can see me. It's the same one at the range here, right? Yeah, it's the same thing that's yeah. down there. Um, and I, I don't think they can see me, but I'm still super cautious. Uh, the first, <laughs> the first day I sat, I didn't realize there was film on both sides of the windows. I couldn't figure out why, why the window looked so fuzzy. And I go, I go trying to clean it and it's got a plastic film on it. I feel like the biggest idiot yeah. in my life. So it's the cover on the plexiglass. So I ripped the, the covers off of like four of the six windows, like that first day making noise. But I'm like, well, I can't see. Um, so in any event, um, he's up there. I'm situated. I'm not moving. And he starts skirting the side, and he's looking down. And over, like, 20, 25 minutes, he makes a loop to come over to the downwind side of me. Mm -hmm. And then he hits this skitter trail, turns and starts, takes, like, two steps down it, big old clump of trees right where he is. I can see his feet, and that's it. And he stops, and he stands there for 20 minutes. How far away, do you think? Oh, 40 yards. Yeah. But no clear shot, right? He walked through two openings where I could have shot at him, but they were, like, 80 yards and 100 yards. From an awkward sitting position mm -hmm. with a short axle to axle bow, I'm not going to do that. No. So in any event, he stands there for like 15 minutes. I've got the front window open. The other ones are all shut. And he eventually turns and starts walking back the way he came. Now, my conclusion to what this was is he heard me coming in and thought I was a cow and came to look for her. Couldn't find her. Couldn't smell her. He didn't run away. So he didn't win me or he would have taken off. Mm -hmm. But he follows the same path going back and i thought really long and hard i went oh my god i'm screwed he's he's gone this is it and i thought really long and hard about taking an 80 or 100 yard shot if he stopped in the opening and one of them he did stop in and i went this is the wrong thing to do i'm not going to do it i was like oh, if he hopefully he comes back and i don't screw it up and i can watch him go and this is over like a whole 45 minute period of time he leaves doesn't run just casually walks away not stop he stopped probably five times but only for five seconds, 10 seconds, and kept going. And he did stop in the 100-yard opening and stood there quartering away. And I I was, I mean, I know it's a shot I can make, but it's like, this is the wrong thing to do. Don't do it. And he kept going. He left. And so now I'm kind of down. Um, and I pull out my phone and check. The camera's not working. There were three deer were standing in front of it for five minutes okay. of that, like right in front of it, and the freaking camera's not working again. It's like, crap which I was optimistic that I would at least know, right? So anyway, now I'm, he's gone. I can get the rest of my layers on. I can zip up my heater body suit. I can get all situated and good. And uh, about an hour and a half goes by, and I see a cow nose off my left side. Mm. Like, okay, all right, here comes a cow. And then 20 seconds later, there's another one. 30 seconds later, there's another what one. What was the weather this day? Uh, same, like teens. Cold and still? Cold and still. Cold and still, no precipitation. Kind of high moonish. Um, Right. It was full moon. Yeah. Yeah, it was full moon. Um, and uh, I think it was a day from being the full, full moon. So, But it was very bright. Like, dude, I could go outside at 2 in the morning you and shoot. You killed the day after me, I think, which was close to full moon, too. Yeah. 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 So I'm uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sitting there. There's, there's third cow. There's a fourth cow. There's a fifth cow. So on this whole time, I, I mind you, I shut all the windows to try to keep the heat in it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I start resituating myself in my chair. I unzip to my to my waist on the heater body suit. I get out. I pick up the bow. I I was gonna try to take the limb legs off because when I was hunting in uh, 
Minnesota, my limb legs hit the blind twice when I was trying to get situated. So I was like, that's extra extension I don't need in that situation. Um, and I still had to get the window open. The window was shut. So this time, now there's like six or seven cows, and three or four of them are standing right in front of me at like 25 yards. Mm-hmm. Feeding or apprehensive Fe- yet? Feeding. No, they're feeding. They came right in and fed. Uh, and I can see him now. I can see his body through the bushes, right? So I'm like, all right, he's right. He's pushing him in there. Yeah. So there was nine of them total before he came in. Was and he the, a different tone, like his color? Was his color different? Yeah, you could visually just look at his color until he was yeah. different. Knew that was him, right? And then I saw it once again. He was facing the same direction. I saw the little gore mark on his mm-hmm. side. Um, and at this point, once I've seen his body, I've got my fingers as far as I could reach forward just to grab the corner of the window to start pulling it open. Meanwhile, while I'm doing that, there's three or four cows facing me mm-hmm. at 25, 30 yards. So I'm slowly opening this window. It probably takes me two to three minutes to get this window all the way open, and I haven't picked up my bow and put it on my lap yet. And I don't get the window all the way open until he's standing in the blind spot just to the left of the window. So he's standing at an angle I could shoot him. He's at 32, 33 yards, and I haven't even got my bow picked up. So I reached over. I picked up my bow, moved it slowly, didn't take the legs off, slid forward a little bit. My release is already hooked on. And everything I do, there's cows looking at me. Like, they're looking at me, and then they look down. They're looking at me, and they look down. He takes three more steps, and now he's in the window, and I can see him. And he's slightly quartering towards me or eighthing towards me, right? And I lean forward a little bit more, and I'm like, okay, I can do this. And I just reach forward and pull up. And as soon as I start to pull, he looks at me, and I just keep pulling. Mm -hmm. I anchor in, pull good, but he turned toward me a little bit more. So it was more like a quartering towards shot now, which is not ideal. But you're talking about a very large chest cavity, and I'm like, I know I can slip through there and still hit that. And it's 30 yards or 32 yards, so that's a very easy shot for me. Anyway, he's uh, he never stopped looking at me. I pulled into the click, and I remember, my first thing I remembered in my head before I did that is, remember what you did on the deer? Because I hammered the crap out of that thing. As soon as I hit the click, I went bang, and I don't do that. Just own it and control it. And pulled into the click put my pin directly behind his shoulder, like touching the crease. And his one shoulder, was his arm was, was front, right, was forward a little bit. So it was still a quartering towards shot, but I had a good angle on it. And pulled, 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 and th- went off. And I literally watched it go right exactly where my pin was because I had a ladder knock and it was easy to see. All the cows blow out of there. He runs up the hill about 30 yards and then tries to go left like the way he came in originally, but not up as high as he went in. And I think he made it two strides and flipped over on his back and his head was stuck on the ground him. and his legs were up in the air. Watched him die. And that was a 400 grain arrow, uh, 70 pounds, 30 inches. It was a lift 29 and a half uh, that I had built that um, the video might be up by the time this comes uh, or not. Um, I told myself that I had two hours to build and tune that bow or I wasn't taking it. Because it was Friday, and I was going to be hunting and sitting with that bow Saturday. Mm -hmm. So I had less than 24 hours from when I first shot it to go hunting with it. I said, all right, I'm I'm only taking this thing if it takes two hours or less. And I think it took me an hour and 20 or an hour and 30 to build it and tune it and broadhead tune it and make a broadhead and a field point and hit in the same spot at 40, 50 yards and figured I probably wasn't shooting past that, so that was good enough. Um, And ended up taking that bow. But uh, I got a complete pass-through. I was using a Grim Reaper Fatal Steel 100-grain three-blade. Um, once again, one of the few broadheads that are in my list of mechanical broadheads that are okay to shoot in an elk. And I literally went through one side, out the other side, nicked part of the shoulder, uh, complete full pass through, and the arrow was in the ground behind him. And a bloodbath of a massacre of uh, a blood trail. It was great. I recorded it. It took me a minute to walk to him from where the arrow was, followed the blood the whole way there. I knew he was dead, but still wanted to follow it. And uh, then I, I spent the next hour trying to get my stupid camera to take a picture with me in it. Like every time I'd run behind it, it would be like <laughs> fuzzy. Mm-hmm. Like there's like 40 pictures in my camera roll and every one of them's a 10 second timer, shove it in my bino harness, run around the other <laughs> side, pick the head up, try to have a smile on your face. And nine out of 10 of them's blurry. Yeah. Like I'm like, why is it blurry? I was cursing, man. I was so mad. Cause I had like, it was, this was the greatest thing ever. Cause I had like two hours. I'm like I got two hours before it gets dark. Yes. This is a miracle. Like how, and so my, and my buddy Nick was actually here in Spokane picking up his dogs because he had to take them to the vet. And so he's like, well, I could be there in like three hours or three and a half hours. I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to get him down to a, a main thoroughfare somehow, one of our roads in our road system. 
Um, and then he's got a Tacoma. Trying to get down hole? Yeah. 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 So he's got a Tacoma, and I have a little dump trailer that my my buddy James, when he moved back to California, was at his house, and he's like, you can have it. And it's literally, I hooked onto it, drove it to my property, and it stayed up there the last three years. Mm -hmm. And I think every animal we've shot has been in the bat in that dump trailer. But my um, my razor doesn't have a hitch on it. Mm -hmm. So he drove his Tacoma up there. We hooked the dump trailer on it. basically a razor. Went basically a razor. <laughs> yeah. Drove his Tacoma up there. Was able to drive it all the way up. It was a little a little hairy once or twice because there was snow, and it's a it's a deep draw that you drive through, so it doesn't thaw out when it gets warm. Mm -hmm. Um Drove all the way up there. I had gotten it down to where all we had to do was pull it into the uh, into the back of the bed. Mind you, I hooked onto it with a heavy duty strap and my razor and pulled it out of the out of the brush because he did make it about sixty yards from where the easiest access point would be. So I did drag him and to get him out. Snow on the ground. Yeah, there was snow on the ground up there. Like I was at the highest point and there was snow everywhere up mm -hmm. there. But once you got down a hundred foot in elevation, there was like patchy snow. Um, so got him drug out, got him situated. Pulled him up in there, and then we drove him down the hill because uh, at this point we'd realized there were more than there was more than one bull. So we're like, well, we don't want to gut him out here because this is going to screw it up. So we drove him down as close to camp as we could get and backed it up over the edge. Uh, and then it's a dump trailer, so I ratcheted his his uh, horns to the dump trailer and then tipped it back, mm. put it, propped it up so he was facing downhill. Awesome. And Nick could just pull the legs around, and I gutted them all out. I hadn't gutted an elk in a long time. Like, I've almost always done gutless, but Big I was animals. like, I'm loading this thing whole on a trailer, and then tomorrow I'm driving to my buddy's house, Dave, the ta taxidermist, to making him cape it out. Mm -hmm. So we, didn't, I caped it out the next day at his house. I had my flatbed in there and ended up putting him on it, but uh, gutted him all the way out, and the lungs were just destroyed. Mm -hmm. Like, big, giant, like, this is an inch and three-eighths cutting diameter, three-blade front-deploying broadhead, right? Steel ferrule. Um, and the hole that was through the lungs was like double that size. And the holes in the animal were way bigger than the cut. But what I've noticed, now that I'm really paying attention to mechanicals, um, is three-blade mechanicals. And this is probably why I like a three-blade so much. When you shoot an animal with a two-blade and a slit, the holes can shift and get to where blood's not like depressurizing. Yeah. Right, hundred percent. And when you shoot a three blade, because it rips the hole at a wider angle, those holes stay in line easier. Mm -hmm. So the pressure release is there. And I think, like every animal I've shot with a three blade, I've gotten a better blood trail than every animal I've shot with a two blade. That's a hundred percent true. Even if it's a big two blade, like a two inch mechanical, yeah. Like the blood trail on my um, on my whitetail, which was a more ideal shot. Both were double lungs, both expired in like fifty yards, right? Mm -hmm didn't bleed nearly as good and it was a bigger cutting diameter broadhead but it was a two blade broadhead so i am i'm almost supremely convinced that i'm shooting a three blade broadhead period like I, yeah. I i don't think i'm ever using a two blade again i'm kind of on that because the benefit of mechanical is that wide cutting diameter and we want damage yes right so you could make an argument to say, ah, oh, two blade fixed. I want the penetration, whatever, for on a big animal. But if you're going mechanical, you want the damage. You yeah. want the blood trail. Yeah. That's the reason you're going to mechanical. So three blade, yeah, three blade. Well, like well, look at the example, right? It was an inch and three eighths cutting mm -hmm. diameter, three blade versus a two inch two blade. And I can absolutely guarantee you my blood trail and the hole was way more vicious on the three blade with a smaller cutting diameter mm -hmm. and the penetration like i went all the way through an elk like and this was a six point bull this is an adult mature large bodied bull mm -hmm. it's huge like it took both of us pulling it downhill on snow and it was it was so much work to get it in the trailer and then get it out of that trailer. We like backed up one trailer to another trailer, and just to drag it from the one trailer to the other trailer was a nightmare. I mean, this this is a lot of mass, mm -hmm. and a four hundred grain arrow at seventy pounds, not seventy five pounds, not eighty pounds, not nothing, and right at thirty inches of draw because that's my draw length's really thirty and a half, but that bow only goes to thirty. But I wanted a short, compact bow, um, and I wanted to test those strings really badly. I want to put it through some abuse and see what it looks like. Um, the the wound channel was vicious. Like so, it, I don't think you need this giant two inch cut stuff. I think you just need a good 
mechanical three blade and that narrows the the path down really quickly i think you'll get just as good a luck with a four blade i just don't think you're going to penetrate as good and that's my bigger concern i think you're running into penetration issues when you start doing four blades because there are very few four blades that are an inch and three eighths cut or an inch and quarter cut not they're all like a two inch swather and that's more force yeah and i want to go all the way through. and your four blade will you'll get more of a diamond cut mm-hmm. and your three blade you'll get more of a triangle, triangle cut yeah and um yeah, I think uh, everything you said there is true. And um, if you're going mechanical, because you're going to get some amount of this, right? Yeah. You're gonna, And with a two-blade, you're not. You're getting that maximum width that's much less than a three-blade. So, yeah. yeah. Well, and if the skin or the hide moves a little bit from that yeah. hole, it's, it doesn't take it moving that much for it to not bleed. Like my entrance yeah. hole on that, um, on that deer was pretty decent size. I didn't get yeah. a drop of blood out of it. It was all in the exit hole, and it wasn't at a steep angle. It was relatively flat. It was almost perfectly flat. It was almost a perfect horizontal swath. Mm-hmm. And my exit hole was had had some decent blood on it, but mm-hmm. you could tell like the hide in the hole had moved a little bit when he was running. Mm-hmm. So it's it's like it's harder for it to come out. It's like the yeah. pressure from the cavity doesn't push it through the hole. Where anytime you do like a three blade hole. It's like way easier for those to stay somewhat in line with each other. I think, I don't know, call me crazy, call me a moron, I don't know. But it, I've noticed it multiple times now that it's rare that I ever shoot an animal with a three blade and there's not a good blood trail. Mm-hmm. So yeah. for what it's worth. I'm on that. Uh, I'm on that. Anything you want to uh, add to that? Any closing stuff? <sighs> it took four years to make that happen. Yeah, four years. And that was pretty, was like I bought that Long property. Journey. I bought that property before my dad died and. I really wish he would, would have been able to see that and see it culminate into that, which was pretty cool. And um, like right after he died, because um, he died in September, um, I ended up hunting for like three or four days up there. And that was my that was my moment where I allowed myself to like feel it and, you know, struggle because nobody's bit of around. grieving or whatever. Yeah, yeah. so that, that place um, will always mean a lot to me for yeah. that. And to to actually see it finally, finally put it all together the way it's intended to, um, and everything worked like it was supposed mm-hmm. to, and all that work and effort. I mean, I, I I'm up there every other weekend. Like mm-hmm. you don't, you people go, oh well, it must be nice to own your own property. And blah, blah, blah. I was like, dude, I work every other weekend on that place all year long. Yeah, and it took four years. I've seen you do it. I've yeah, seen you do I'm it. I'm gone I've seen, all the time doing. I've that. I've been a part of so many of your stories where you're like, you're back on Monday doing fulfillment, and you're like, fucking elk showed up. So I actually had a feeling that Monday I was like, because you weren't coming back for fulfillment, I was like, he's going to catch it. Hey. Oh, goodness. Oh, goodness. Hey, hey, hey. Hey. Whoa. Hey. <laughs> hey. That's enough. Knock hey. it off. Hey. hey. We have, we have three dogs in here, and somebody heard something, and they're all going ape shit. Yeah. Oh. Um, I had a funny feeling because... Mia. Psst. Hey, it's okay. It's okay, baby. <laughs> I had a funny feeling because you weren't coming back for fulfillment that it was going to happen. Just one of those sixth sense kind of things. Yeah. And uh, I was very happy to hear well, it shook out. It was the most consistent it had ever been. So yeah. I was like, man, if it's ever going to work, it's going to work here. Um, and then uh, Nick's been trying still because it's still open. Mm-hmm. But um, the there's a crew of logging guys showed up like three days later logging the ne- next door property. So it's probably done. But... But yeah, it was just great to f- like actually see your work pay off mm-hmm. on a four year freaking plan, man. Four years, that was, yeah. That was a long time to to get that little payoff. So it's a good it, time investment, but it is. You know, it's a pretty sweet deal. Watch it come together, and uh, things keep going well. It'll only continue to elk will show up more often or whatever. Yeah, yeah. assuming our state doesn't do really dumb stuff, which is high, which likelihood. is a wild card in Washington. High likelihood in this state, but yeah. ten year total. From start to finish, ten years, I it should be really easy. Like it should be consistent. And my my goal is to not be not be just good enough to, you know, pull it off every year, but be able to take like one person and get them uh, an elk so they can experience that. But we'll see. Cool. Yeah. But good, man. I I'm great eternally grateful. Awesome. Yeah. Anyway, um you have a bonus hunt that we're gonna share a little I uh, will share um coming up. So subscribe or or you know, tune in from wherever you're posted. And pretty uh, pretty freaky story. You're gonna wanna you're probably gonna wanna hear that yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. 
anyway, we're wrapping up our season here. And um, if you're hunting, keep hunting hard and keep at it. And uh, that's the pod. That's the pod.